and welcome to this episode of the Martial Arts Studies Podcast. This episode is made up of a keynote presentation given by Professor Lauren Griffith at the Martial Arts Studies Conference in Switzerland in June, July 2022. Um, the sound quality is not brilliant at the start, but it improves. So I'm gonna, I've left on the introduction given to Lauren by uh, Daniel Jacquet. Now Daniel's walking around quite far away from the microphone so he talks for a minute or so and, and the sound quality is not great but I think you can hear it. Um, so Lauren's presentation is on social justice and capoeira and it's um, an introduction to her argument in her forthcoming book which is called Graceful Resistance and it's about capoeira and social justice. Um, so again Sound quality is not great at first. Uh, the the quality of um, the sound in Lauren's talk is good. And then there's a question and answer session at the end. So some of the audience questions are quiet, but again, Lauren is close to the microphone so you can hear her answers really well. So I hope you enjoy it. Well, it looks like the Swiss watch says we're about to begin. This is very nice. Um, of course, this is not Lauren Scheiner. She could not come. She has COVID. She is missed. And she promised that she would show up at the next conference. So if you are here for Lauren Scheiner, you will be deceived, but also surprised because we have the best Replacement ever, Lauren, thank you very much. Same uh, prénom, c'est aussi Lauren, but Griffith, this time. Lauren uh, Griffith is an associate professor of anthropology at Texas Tech University. She studies performance and tourism in Latin America and the US. Specifically, she focuses on Afro-Brazilian martial arts, capoeira, and how non-Brazilian practitioners used to travel to Brazil to increase the legitimacy within this genre. Her work on Capoeira has been published in the Annals of Tourism Research, the Journal of Sport and Tourism, the Theatre Annual, and the Theatre Annual. And she is the author of In Search of Legitimacy How Outsiders Become Part of the Afro Brazilian Capoeira Tradition. Uh, her second book, titled Apprenticeship Pilgrimage, with uh, Jonathan Esmail, was published in January of 2018 by Lexington Books. Dr. Griffith, her newest work is on the relationship between globalized arts form and locally focused civic engagement. Lauren, thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So thank you all for coming here this afternoon and allowing me to talk about what is going to be my third book, Graceful Resistance. It's coming out in 2023 by University of Illinois Press. Um, I would like to thank Daniel and Paul, who unfortunately is not with us, um, for giving me this opportunity to speak and to also share my sympathy with Lauren Steimer, who was unable to attend. Um, I was really looking forward to her paper, so I am sad not to get to see it. Uh, my work is situated in the U.S., and today I want to start by taking you to the streets of a major city on the West Coast on a sunny summer day of 2020. A few hundred capoeiristas are there with their beer and bows, a single stringed instrument that you can see up here. It's played by striking the wire with a stick while moving its gourd resonating chamber to and from your abdomen, uh, changing the sound of the notes by pressing a rock or a coin against the wire. The rhythm they're playing today is called cavalleria or cavalry. Faster and faster the rhythm is played emulating the sound of horse hooves on cobblestone streets as the mounted police arrive. Back in the early days of the new Brazilian Republic, when playing capoeira was illegal, this rhythm was intended as a warning for one's fellow capoeiristas. Watch out, the cavalry is coming. Run away before you get caught. But on this day, it's a different kind of warning. The energy or ashe of this event is palpable even through the mediation of Facebook's live stream. Watching it after the fact from my son's nursery turned pandemic home office, I think I came closer than I've ever come before to catching a glimpse of the complicated emotions that might have animated the early capoeira games of enslaved Africans in Brazil. 
At this event in June of 2020, there was joy at finally being together in person after months and months of isolation and pandemic lockdowns. There was anger, rage really, at the blatant injustice of yet another black man being murdered in broad daylight by someone whose job it was to ensure his welfare. And finally, there was the hope engendered by doing something about it. The Capoeiristas continue the rhythm, accelerating its intensities. This time, it isn't a warning that the police are coming, though the marchers were alert to that possibility, and they prepared for that with lawyers on hand in case anyone was arrested. But no, today it was a warning that the people are coming. Now é agressão, I remember my teacher in Brazil saying. It isn't aggression, it's having an objective, a purpose in our movements. He was talking about a kick. These capitalistas had a different objective. Watch out, here come the people and they won't passively comply when the state sanctions violence. Now I've been doing research on capoeira for almost 20 years and that is my mestre up there. Uh, at least six of those years were spent training it pretty intensively. My earlier work focused on how non-Brazilians use travel as a way to establish themselves as legitimate practitioners of the art form. And I'm gonna offer a brief introduction to the history of capoeira. Uh, but at this point, I just wanna point out that capoeira is considered part of Brazil's immaterial cultural patrimony and an iconic part of the African diaspora. Now these don't have to be mutually exclusive, of course but putting more emphasis on one half of the Afro-Brazilian equation than the other, or even presenting them as equal, regularly leads to tensions within the Capoeira community. In my initial work, which involved participant observation in Brazil and the US, as well as archival research and interviews with more than 30 Capoeiristas, I found myself gravitating towards groups that have an Afrocentric approach to the art and its history. But interestingly, when I reflected upon who I actually interviewed, the vast majority of the non-Brazilians were completing what I called a, an apprenticeship pilgrimage to Brazil. They were mostly white. Why, I wondered, weren't there more people of African descent traveling to study under the guidance of Brazilian mestres or masters? Perhaps it was a complete coincidence. Perhaps the cost of travel and time away from work was more prohibitive for black capoeiristas than their white counterparts. Or perhaps their racial identity gave them a sense of belonging that white capoeiristas lacked and were therefore seeking to acquire through travel. I still haven't worked that out because when I tried, I almost immediately got distracted by something I found even more perplexing and interesting. In the fall of 2016, I reached out to a young black capoeirista from Detroit whose Facebook post had piqued my curiosity. Between quoting James Baldwin and some of the claims he made about Capoeira's history, I thought this would be a promising place to start my inquiries about what Capoeira means to African Americans. I asked about the demographics of his group, expecting to get a breakdown of males to females, blacks to whites, so on. But instead he said, quote, there are no all lives matter folk in the Hoda, end quote. Now, if you recall, the fall of 2016 was a very tense time in the United States. President Obama's time in the White House was concluding. A tide of white nationalism was rising. Non-white and non-cisgender people were justifiably afraid for their lives. And the seemingly straightforward and to me uncontentious claim that Black Lives Matter was being twisted and misrepresented. So perhaps it isn't surprising that within this context, my interlocutor's comments sent me off asking new questions about the political sympathies and commitments of capoeira groups in the US. To what degree did capoeiristas get involved in social causes? And did they join capoeira groups with this social justice mindset already in place? Or for lack of a better term, did they become woke in the course of their training? Of course, I had to admit the possibility that I had just stumbled on a group that was politically active. And it was just a coincidence that the first group I ever trained with was also pretty vocal in their support of left-leaning causes and the second group. But I went looking for other examples. I interviewed an additional 30, 35 capoeiristas and found socially engaged groups in places where you probably expect to find them, 
Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Chicago, and Oakland, California. And then I found them in some places you might not expect. Utah, Alabama, Texas, all historically conservative states. Ultimately, what I found was that the discourse surrounding Capoeira's origins supports a multitude of justice-oriented projects of varying scales being enacted by present-day Capoeiristas in the U.S. What happens inside the Capoeira Academy becomes a template for action that can be carried out in the world beyond. Following Boal 1974, I believe that art as a form of human agency is inherently and necessarily political. Even when art is not being used intentionally for political ends, any time an artist has to make decisions about what to include, what to exclude, or how to present something, those decisions are shaped by the artist's place in society. The formative experience that he or she has had are in no small part a result of how structures of power affect a person based on his or her class, race, gender, immigration status, etc. Hence the phrase, the personal is political, which was popularized in Carol Hanish's 1969 essay. Art is a common avenue through which people who lack political and economic power make their voices heard. Being able to speak directly about one's circumstances is a privilege. In the words of performance theorist Dwight Conkergood, people in subordinated positions do not have, quote, the luxury of transparency, the presumptive norm of clear and direct communication, free and open debate on a level playing field that the privileged classes take for granted, end quote. This is why performance, art, and play in general are ideal arenas in which to seek examples of social justice efforts. When we encounter difficult situations, play is not an escape, but an opportunity to work through that trouble. Play allows us to enter into the subjunctive mode and imagine, what if? What if I were a superhero? What if I could challenge my oppressor? Such forms of play can be transformative. And under the right circumstances, play can translate into social justice action. Drawing from the work of Theo Harris 2007, I associate social justice with any number of caring and compassionate efforts to, to, to disrupt and subvert social structures that perpetuate inequality, as well as working for the equitable distribution of wealth, opportunities, and well being across all segments of society. Social justice is any intentional action people do in order to help underserved communities or raise awareness about something that they deem unfair. But why would Capoeira specifically be linked to social justice? Understanding this demands at least a quick look at the history and the mythology that surrounds its origins. I'm gonna show you a very brief clip so that you can kind of visualize what I'm talking about. This video is from a 2017 Zoom Bimba event. I wasn't at this particular event. I did go to the Zoom Bimba event in 2019. The name of this event comes from a combination of two larger than life figures, Zumbi and Bimba, or Mestre Bimba. Zumbi is famous for being the leader of colonial Brazil's largest maroon community, Quilombo dos Palmares. And while this community probably didn't really rely solely or even significantly on capoeira as an actual form of fighting off Brazilian soldiers with guns, the success of Zumbi and Palmares has over time become wrapped up in these songs and the folk tales of capoeira as an example of how capoeira can be used to resist oppression. Mestre Bimba, a much more recent figure, was instrumental in having capoeira recognized as a legitimate sport in the eyes of the modern Brazilian state. His son, Mestre Nanel, is the older man that you're gonna see in this video, and he works hard to keep his father's legacy alive by teaching classes and presiding over an international network of schools that practice Bimba's techniques. The younger man is Contra Mestre Malandro. He's an African-American man in his early 40s, raised in Detroit, but moved to California as an adult. He created the Zumbimba annual event to honor both Zumbi and Bimba, and it's one of at least two regular events in his school's calendar that focuses on explicitly honoring and supporting Black culture. 
And what I want you to do is really pay attention to the voiceover, because I think it's a great example of how capoeira is being interpreted specifically in the U.S. Tradition, language, connectedness. When we get master in that now, passing this tradition along with my mom's brother, he got from his father, master in me. Three generations. Kapoe is your now. African Americans need to understand that this is a tradition. This is something that's been going on for centuries, and they need to feel that connectedness, not just with Capoeira, but through Capoeira, they can connect with their brothers, the African Brazilians. Because we all come from West Africa, we're all the same people, and we're learning this tradition through dodging the shots and giving them back through that, that spiritual conversation that happens in the center of the hall. You begin to learn that, yeah, you were born yesterday and you're alive today. But now you're immersed in an energy, in an ashe that can't be created or destroyed. Because it was always here and it always will be. And it makes a whole human mess. Okay. So what you just saw is an example of the regional or regional style of capoeira. My training is in the Angola style which tends to be slower, lower to the ground, and more focused on trickery and deceit than acrobatics. Now, as you probably know, given that it is in fact a martial art, the moves are completely improvised. We do train certain movements together, like habajahaya or the stingray kick with the negachiva defensive posture. So it's pretty common to see them paired in actual play, especially by beginners. But there's obviously no reason that somebody can't counter with a different move and players are rewarded in terms of their prestige and status for being able to come up with creative, elegant solutions to situations inside the hoda or space of play. The songs that are sung during play are almost always in Portuguese. Now, there are some isolated Yoruba words that pop up, and I've heard of some groups composing songs in other languages, uh, but these are the exceptions rather than the rule, and kind of contentious, that would be a whole different talk. The lyrics of the song, if you can understand them, and that is important, they often recount aspects of being enslaved, references to African deities, or they might describe aspects of Brazilian life. Sometimes they contain coded messages, like if a player uses his or her hands too much inside the hoda and appears to be grappling, which is most definitely against the rules, then the orchestra might start a song about a clinging woman. And we'll talk about that sexism in just a couple of minutes. So how did all of these elements come together? It really depends on who you ask. And scholars have poked holes in the narrative that many capoeiristas tell, but the myth matters. Essentially, the story that capoeiristas tell goes something like this. Enslaved Africans brought their various fighting styles with them when they were brought to the new world, where they were blended together. But white slave owners prohibited fighting, both because they didn't want their so-called property getting damaged, and um, they also were afraid that these well-trained enslaved people could rise up in revolt. So in response, the enslaved Africans added music and singing to their practice of martial arts, they disguised it at dance, and that was allowed. Thus, they were able to continue training under the noses of the white property owners, biding their time until they could escape and they used capoeira as spiritual sustenance in the meantime. Now, for my purposes, the veracity of the story is of little importance, but what is significant is that when I ask people why they think there's a connection between capoeira and social justice, they often point back to this story in order to explain that resisting oppression has always been part of it. Here we go. Um, there are three primary ways in which I see social just permeating the capoeira community. Personal transformation, group actions, and individual utilization of capoeira for social goals. And I want to start with personal transformations. Now, in some ways, the presence of a social justice orientation within capoeira presents us with a chicken and egg problem. After all, nobody is forced to do capoeira. And like one of my interlocutors explained to me, if you aren't on board with your group's social mission, you probably won't stick around for very long. 
And I've actually heard of some mestres encouraging people to leave if they aren't on board with these worldviews. And yes, I do recognize the hypocrisy in that. But it suffices to say that capoeiristas are a self-selecting group. So I'm not going to argue that training capoeira is going to magically turn somebody anti-fascist. But what I do see is a subtle shift in many capoeiristas' affective habitus that comes about as a result of training this socially charged art in the company of diverse others. So I'm going to slow down here for a minute because in typical academic fashion, I just threw a completely made up phrase at you. Uh, it will come as no surprise to you all as martial arts scholars when I say that Louis Waquant's 2004 work on the boxer's habitus has become a foundational piece of scholarship that is often used to explain not only the importance of researchers participating in the arts they study, but also the vast ways in which an individual is shaped by his or her involvement in a particular community of practice. Greg Downey has done an excellent job of demonstrating how a capoeirista's physical habitus, the embodied dispositions that allow her to navigate specific social fields, are altered by her training. Having used his own body as an instrument of data collection, Downey vividly writes about the experience of catching his foot in a subway train door, but having the ability to calmly extract himself because of the ways in which his body and his perceptions of space had been molded by capoeira. I argue that something similar happens at the level of an individual's affective engagement with the world. Just as there is a physical habitus, so too is there an affective habitus. Capoeira has the power to alter an individual's affective habitus, the underlying emotional orientation towards the world that one acquires as a result of his or her engagement with a particular social field. These emotions are performative in the sense that they cause us to act in certain ways, particularly in relation to others within our social worlds. The circulation of emotions between people as well as animals, places, and various things, helps to constitute our subject positions. Affect is not just a feeling or the act of feeling something, it is the agentive power of those feelings to set bodies in motion. When my friend Riser says that he is, quote, frustrated, when he hears about another black man like himself being murdered by the police, he is using the language of emotion, but it may not, and likely does not, accurately convey his visceral response to these events. The way that Riser paused before settling on the word frustrated, the way he drew out its syllables and took a breath upon completing its utterance, all index the disconnect between his visceral reaction to these atrocities and the ways in which he has been socialized to talk about them, especially with a white woman like myself. Now, in this talk, I am not probing the gap between affect and emotion, which White, 2017, rightly argues is productive ground for further research. I simply want to explain that I chose the term affective habitus rather than emotional habitus because I believe capoeira does not just shape the way in which practitioners talk about their feelings, but the underlying responses to social situations that give rise to action and those talked about feelings. In using the term affective habitus, I want to point out the ways in which membership in particular communities leads to individual members adopting similar emotional orientations to the world. Now, that doesn't mean that we are all gonna feel the same way about every issue. No two boxers move in exactly the same way, and no two capoeiristas will have the exact same beliefs about the art's history, its contemporary uses, its potential for fighting social injustice, or the responsibility that we have for taking action with regard to those injustices. Yet much in the same way that Wakwant was able to document the boxer's habitus and the ways in which that habitus is cultivated, so too can we identify some general features of the capoeirista's affective habitus and how it comes to be. I'll offer one example. Several authors have discussed malicia or malandragem as key defining features of capoeira that transfer over into real life and the way one walks in the world. Yes. Recognizing the power differentials that govern relationships in the hora and in the world at large alters the ways in which capoeiristas yes. move through those spaces. Inside the hora, that might look like a smaller woman staying out of her male opponent's reach because she knows that he might pick her up and physically place her outside of the hora something that violates all the formal rules of capoeira, 
but is nonetheless known to occur. Or it might manifest in a player marking rather than fully executing a leg sweep against a mestre if he or she senses that that move might result in the mestre holding a grudge or retaliating in some way. Outside of the hoda, this might take the form of wariness towards those who hold power in society and a calibration of one's actions in response to that differential. When someone has begun to experience the world in terms of power differentials, if he hears about a black man being murdered during a traffic stop or in the course of dealing with a minor infraction, he's inclined not to ask whether or not the victim complied with the officer's orders, but to focus instead on the officer's uses and abuses of power that they held relative to the victim. Brianna is a white woman who grew up, on the east, grew up on the East Coast of the US. She doesn't describe herself as a social justice warrior per se, but says she is aware of a lot of social issues, both because of her upbringing and because of her involvement in Capoeira. She started training martial arts about 20 years ago, mostly East Asian and Filipino styles, but she switched to Capoeira about 10 years ago because she thinks it offers something that the others don't. And those are her words, not mine. Brianna says that one of the things that has changed for her as a result of practicing capoeira is an increased awareness of how she talks to her Black friends. She said that one night she was riding in the passenger seat while her Black friend, a guy, was driving. They got pulled over, and the first thing that the cops did was ask her if she was all right. After the incident, her friend said, that's what you call driving while Black. Before capoeira, she wouldn't necessarily have been exposed to or understood the reality of what it's like to be pulled over for quote unquote driving while black. She says that once you become aware of these things, you have to change the way you act. Otherwise you're being a dick. If you know someone doesn't like something, don't do it. It's just common sense in her book. Proximity to people of color in an environment that demands vulnerability and produces intimacy creates a space for people to change long held assumptions about race. That is powerful. And it is but one example of the ways, both big and small, the Capoeiristas report having their hearts and minds opened up by being part of a Capoeiristic group. Now, some groups are more explicit in connecting their art with their political commitments. Two of the people that I interviewed in the Bay Area remember playing Capoeira at one of the encampments that was erected during the Occupy movement. Jeff is a white male activist, and he told me that they went there to bring joy to the protest, that performing in that setting was a way to sustain the people who were actually there camping out for days on end. Lucha, a phenotypically white woman of Latinx descent, explained, quote, that the idea of community, of spending time together, of enjoying each other's company, of making personal connections, of singing, of making music, and playing together is anti-capitalist. This, she thinks, is a better example of how capitalists can resist oppression today than the quote unquote fucking slave narrative, which doesn't make sense to her. Lucha recognizes that of course there's money involved in capoeira. Instructors must be compensated for their time and expertise. And actually the frequency with which black teachers in particular are often expected to perform or teach for free indexes the effects of white supremacy even within the capoeira community. But much of what goes on within the capoeira community cannot be quantified, and it's based on generalized reciprocity. Most of the people I interviewed simply told me that capoeira is social justice, implying that because capoeira is rooted in resisting oppression, any fruit born of it will have a social justice flavor. I don't think they're wrong, but Lucha's comments made me think about it more critically helping me see how easily that narrative is spread without an interrogation of what aspects of Capoeira's present day practice actually challenge the systemic nature of oppression under which present day people live. Lucha was able to articulate how the lived experience of being a Capoeirista today challenges these hegemonic assumptions about how contemporary society works. Another example of groups using Capoeira for activist causes comes from the East Coast of the US. As many of you may recall, in 2016, Minnesota cafeteria worker Philando Castile 
was shot and killed during a traffic stop, despite declaring to the police officer that he had a gun in his glove box, which he was licensed to carry. When this happened, Bruno, a Brazilian capoeira mestre, knew he couldn't carry on with class as usual. When his students arrived, he told them to grab the rear bows and jump on the train so that they could join a Black Lives Matter protest. Bruno told me that most of his students were on board with this decision and one thanked him because she had considered skipping class that night to go to the protest, but thought it would be even more healing for her to be with her capoeira group. His decision honored the students' need for community and their wish to use capoeira for social action. But most teachers are far less willing to mandate students' participations in events like this. They might encourage their students to participate, but stop short of insisting. Sometimes this is because they don't want to endanger their organization's nonprofit status by politicizing participation in the group. In other instances, they only want people to participate if it is a genuine reflection of their commitments. Brahm, for example, might require students to do community service, but he did not demand that they participate in any of his city's protests after George Floyd was murdered in 2020. That felt too personal. Nonetheless, many of his students did participate in a variety of efforts to support the cause. And just as a reminder, especially because we're here as an international group of scholars, George Floyd was a black man who was detained by police officers after allegedly paying for a pack of cigarettes with a, a counterfeit $20 bill. Um, and if you recall, an officer knelt on his neck for more than nine minutes, despite his protests, um, and that directly led to his death. Brahm lives in a city and teaches capoeira in the city that was absolutely rocked by protests in the aftermath of this death. Now, even though, as Brahm notes, the violent death of Black people due to police brutality has become almost commonplace, he still feels it personally. Whereas Bruno insisted that his group go protest after Castile was murdered because, as he put it, it could be one of them next time, Braun does not mandate students' participation because, quote, it feels like it's happening to me. The difference here is slight, but it's important. Bruno's comment is concerned with the future likelihood of excessive force being used against people of color. Brahms is focused on the present and his own internalization of the pain brought about by the terrorization of the Black community. The different stances they take could be interpreted in a number of different ways. Bruno is Brazilian. Brahm is from the U.S. Bruno's phenotype is ethnically ambiguous, but he is Euro-descended. Brahm is without question Black. Their unique positionalities may also explain this difference as well as their personalities. Both leaders are very conscious of the power that they hold within the capoeira community, particularly the influence that they have over their students. So in the way that Bruno approaches this, he is using his power to put his students and their bodies out in the public sphere as a way of supporting the African diaspora. This action is 100% in keeping with his organization's stance on social justice. Brahms' refusal to do so is also consistent with his leadership philosophy, which focuses on the ethic of care. He expects students to take care of one another, and this extends to supporting individuals in the community who are in pain because of what is going on in the world. Bruno's philosophy demands a visible embodied presence so that those with political power see resistance. Brahms' philosophy calls for individual acts of support that may never be visible to the world at large. One is not better than another, and both, in my opinion, align with the value system of capoeira. I wanna tell one last story before pointing out some contradictions and possibilities for future wow. research. In a California clinic for teens with double diagnoses, meaning mental health concerns as well as addiction, a group of patients are paired off for their next exercise. One person is to do a mea luigi French, while the other does a coperinha. If done correctly, the mea lua, a half moon kick, will sail harmlessly over the other person's head as they squat down and block their face. In one of the pairs, the person doing coperinha has been identified as a suicide risk. The partner doing the kick is very athletic, but today, for whatever reason, his balance is off. He wobbles. It looks like he's about to fall. The person defended is, quote, scared, scared to the point of being frozen, 
like a deer in the headlights, end quote. They are so scared that they are physically incapable of dropping down into a squat to get out of the way of the kick. Rene, a capoeira mestre, as well as a licensed therapist, stops the exercise and talks to the pair. Just put your arms up, he explains, so that if you do get hit, it'll just hit the arm, it won't hit your face. Now, when it's all over, Rene goes back and asks the person, so what were you feeling? You looked like you were scared. And the person, the suicide risk responds, of course, I was terrified, I could have gotten killed. And that's the crux of it. What? Renee prods. You didn't want it that? Renee described this incident for me as a way of explaining how he has used capoeira as a form of therapy. By this point, his patients were familiar with the basics of capoeira and accustomed to the way Renee would have them practice and then stop and discuss the issues that came up in the course of training. My head hurts after doing this, someone might say. What does it feel like? Renee would query. It feels like there's these plants that are growing out of my brain. That's what it feels like. So Renee presses further. Well, what kind of plants? Is it a tree? Is it weeds? The intimacy they shared enabled the participants to use the tangibility of their physical experiences with capoeira as a springboard to more abstract discussions of their mental health and overall wellness. So what happened when he called attention to the irony of an apparently suicidal patient being frozen by their fear of getting killed? Boom, deer in the headlights again. The person's frozen, realizing that there's another part of him, the core part of him, that living animal that doesn't want to die. And that the idea of ending his life was never, is not something that they were ever really all in on. The experience that Renee was able to facilitate through the use of capoeira, quote, allowed them to come out of that state of suicidality. There is a phrase in the song that my own mestre often sings before beginning a hora. Jogi aqui, jogi pra lá. Play here, play out there. It is a command. Play here means to play the physical game of capoeira right here and now in this physical space. Play out there is a reminder that we also play capoeira out there in the world at large. Just like we may have to use our wits to outmaneuver a bigger, stronger opponent inside the hara, we should remember that real life matchups are rarely fair and we have to use whatever resources available to us in order to succeed. We sway inside the hara in order to avoid getting kicked. We go with the flow in real life to avoid being broken by the injustices of society. Capoeira is a big part of your mindset, another one of my interlocutors told me. It doesn't mean I'm going around doing kicks everywhere I go, he said. Rather, it's something you carry with you all the time. And now the other shoe is going to drop. So far, I painted a really rosy picture of the Capoeira community. And there is a lot of good that's being done within these groups and by these groups but no group is perfect. I have yet to meet an ultra conservative capoeira group or a blatantly white nationalist one. There's one that might fit the bill, but they haven't answered any of my emails. I can't imagine. <laughs> uh, but there are a lot of groups that just aren't interested in all of this social justice stuff. Now on the surface, they're practicing the same art, but they aren't using the song lyrics, folklore or history as a springboard for cultivating activists. Now, in some ways, simply keeping the tradition alive is a form of resistance, especially considering that it was once illegal in Brazil and that capoeiristas were stigmatized because of the arts association with blacks and vagrants. But several of the people I interviewed believe that practicing capoeira without standing up against contemporary acts of injustice is a form of hypocrisy. Then there's the fact that even if capoeira was created as a way of resisting an oppressive social order in which one group had ultimate power and control over another, um, capoeira is a martial art with a hierarchical structure. So the mestre still has complete authority over those groups, and he or she can kick out anyone that doesn't align with their vision. Several of my interlocutors referred to themselves as capoeira orphans because they had been ostracized for standing up to their mestres and for calling them out on their bad behavior. But sometimes this gatekeeping is even more subtle. Mestre Bimba himself would only accept students if they were employed or enrolled in school, which meant that his students 
tended to be whiter and wealthier than the general population in which the school was situated. In the US, I know of several teachers who will either only admit students if they can write a paper on the history of Capoeira, or they'll require a paper for their promotion. Now, I understand this as an insistence that their students take the art seriously and investigate its history, but the focus on reading and writing is also pretty ironically a demand that they express their knowledge in a colonial medium. Finally, perhaps the biggest threat to Capoeira itself being socially just is gender discrimination and sexual harassment, both of which are known to be fairly common within this community. I've witnessed a lot of microaggressions focused on the female body and the expectation that even strong martial artists continue to perform femininity, femininity even while they are sweating and kicking and defending themselves. I've heard a lot of women say that they must work twice as hard as a man in order to be recognized and promoted. None of this is particularly surprising. I've also collected numerous stories about women being sexually harassed and even assaulted, especially at large capoeira events. The perpetrator is often a highly ranked male, typically a mestre, who abuses his power. The politics of desire within the Capoeira community are complex and complicated by its hierarchical structure and are deserving of more treatment, something that I hope to turn my attention to in my next project and something that Gina is working on as well. In the meantime, I will note that several groups have started talking circles to try and address some of these issues. And I've also noticed that more and more groups are requiring participants at their big events like workshops and belt graduation ceremonies to sign honor pledges before they're allowed to join the events. Now, to what degree these actually work is yet to be decided. Lua Negra, who organized the event I talked about at the beginning of my paper and who you saw there with his beautiful beer and bow in front of the city hall. He recently organized a Zoom panel with six featured guests, myself included. Is the social justice reckoning of 2020 still alive or has it died? He wanted to know. I was impressed that about 30 people attended, though this was far less than the hundreds of people who attended similar events in the summer of 2020 when George Floyd's murder was fresh in everyone's mind. This is not particularly surprising. Flashpoints ignite righteous indignation that sooner or later cools into indifference, or maybe not indifference, but burnout. Our attention gets divided by the many other things that demand immediate attention. And I'm not just talking about the big things like the war in Ukraine, an attempted coup at the US Capitol, or the stripping away of women's rights to bodily autonomy. Work must be done, bills must be paid, and children must be tended to. But the Capoeiristas who tuned into Lua Negra's panel were passionate about the need for us to continue pursuing social justice from within the Capoeira community. Our discussion reflected the social moment we are in now. A major theme was trauma and the need for Capoeira teachers to become trauma-informed so they can support all kinds of students. And there was an emphasis on the literature about structural inequality, racism, and white supremacy. If you ask me, the core ethos of capoeira is resisting oppression. What that oppression is and who is perpetuating and benefiting from that oppression and how it should be resisted are all things that change over time. But as long as capoeiristas stay true to the underlying essence of their art, I believe we will continue to see a melding of art and activism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now I'll open the questions. Please. Do you maybe have uh, statistics or health numbers of American non brazilian black men that prove the, the practitioners and their social background, more specifically, what's the share of the higher education advertised? and maybe of degree of unionization. Unionization in what way? 
How many of the petitions are members of the union? Ten. I live in the U.S., so <laughs> um, that's a really great question, and I wish that I had actual tangible numbers for that. As far as the <laughs> union question goes, I would say that most of the people I talk to would love to be part of the union, um, but there is such backlash against it in general in the states that I don't know if any of them are to what degree they're involved in that kind of thing. Um, as far as you know, breakdown of, of who all is in this. I started this with a, a really narrow-minded assumption. I thought that I would see this kind of activism primarily in Capoeira Angola groups, because that was my background. I know them to be, generally speaking, um, Afrocentric, whereas some of the contemporanea, the other styles, not as much. Um, so I was surprised to, to, I actually had a student do this, um, catalog all of the Capoeira groups we could find in the U.S. and give me a breakdown of the style. And then she did a really quick and dirty content analysis of like her websites. And I would say that 50% of them are doing Capoeira justice stuff regardless of the style. Um, Angola versus Haitiana versus Contemporanea made almost zero difference. As far as educational attainment, the people that I, I interviewed, so the 37 people who I'm referring to in this particular sample, um, most were at least college educated, some had master's degrees, and there was one MD and one PhD in the sample. So they do tend to be on the, the higher side as far as formal education goes. Um, and I'll also make note that several of them went to historically black universities or colleges in the US. So that has a very particular politicized flavor to it as well. Other questions? Yes, Hello, thank you so much. Um, could you talk a bit more about the talking groups that you mentioned, what kind of um, issues were talked about, and also how much appetite is there for how this is interested in between groups? Is there collaboration between uh, yes. groups talking about these issues? So, one of these flashpoint incidents that occurred. Um, a woman came out about 10 years after the incident occurred and said, when I was underage, this master a pursued a sexual relationship with me. At the time, she was below the age of consent. Um, so she was uh, justifiably traumatized and angry and, and voicing this. And that there was pretty strong backlash against her right after, like, oh, you've waited so long. And the master a pulled this whole, oh, but she was a mature teenage girl, right? Um, and when that happened, almost immediately, there was an open letter that was written. Um, this is where I get a little bit uncomfortable about cancel culture, right? So the mystery was blacklisted from some events, um, and this is all very public. I'm not gonna name names, but like, if you're in that area, you probably know. Um, and after that, the talking circles formed, and initially it was a female-only talking circle and a male-only talking circle because they wanted to have safe space specifically for the women. Um, but a male activist in the community, like I mentioned earlier, also felt very strongly that they need to come to terms with how the patriarchy harms them um, and how they have been perpetuating violence against their, their female camaradas, even not knowing. Um, and then they kind of merged and had conversations together. And I know that similar groups have been happening throughout the US. And I would say that one of the silver linings of the pandemic, if we're allowed to say that, um, is that Zoom has allowed some of these groups to be geographically diverse. So it's not just the Bay Area anymore, um, but it's you know people from across the country that have been affected that are doing larger circles. Yeah. Just as a follow-up to that, out of curiosity, is there overlap or, or how do you see if there is um, between the the culture and basically being the culture and then this physical Oh, that's a, a really interesting idea. Um, I don't know if the people who organize the groups, I mean, they're calling them circles, right? And, yeah, and circle, holiday, it's, it's English yeah. translation of Portuguese work. Um, I don't know if that was an intentional choice or not. I know that it is intended to be non-hierarchical. Um, so everyone is engaging on, on even footing. But whether or not that was an intentional choice, I don't know. This is not at all what you asked, but I can tell you that there was, um, unrelated to gender issues, a guy in my sample who also happens to be a brown beret. So he's a, a 
Chicano activist and he goes to protests and things. And the way he helps sort of form the line around the protesters is very much modeled on Capoeira. Um, and the way he also is involved in a, a subgroup of his Capoeira group called Capoeiristas for Social Justice. Um, and they talk about it in terms of, okay, one person's going to jump into the hoda and shake it out, um, by which he means talk through the issue with his father and them. And, you know, like somebody got followed home because of their religious identity. How are we going to save or protect that person? Um, sorry, I didn't answer the question you asked, but it reminded me of something else. Yeah. I just mentioned, um, before the clip, you should pay attention to the voiceover. And I did, so I'm curious if you can speak more to, I mean, to that, that presentation, which I means are referred to as ritual, but didn't use the word. Now that you spoke of a pan Africanism, I think that it's just that you wouldn't be like, yeah, you just like basics, like that's not the Brazilian. So, yeah. I mean, what that says about whether African American activism or, or kind of a, a myth then of a pan African experience is yes. not really there, but maybe presence in the presence or what, what why you keep calling it the pan African. But I can think of saying, you know, that about it. yeah, um, that's exactly what I wanted you to pay attention to because it's that one, you know, it comes from Africa and we're all African. Wait, what? Um, which that is a really strong part of discourse within the capoeira community that um, when questions arise about who am I as a white woman to play this art, right? Oh, well, we're all from Africa. Um, and so people are, are, you know, yes, mitochondrial Eve came from Africa. We go far enough back, sure. Um, but I find that to be too easy. It's, it's uh, an overly simplified way that people sort of grant themselves permission to engage in cultural appropriation. Um, so I found it very interesting that the Black narrator is using that particular trope. Um, and I say that the way he is using it is to establish this connection with the African diaspora. Um, and like I said at the very beginning of the talk, that is one way to stir up some trouble, um, is by putting more emphasis on the, the Afro or the Brazilian. You're going to make something like that, even if you present them as equal, right? Um, but the socially, the groups I have worked with that are inclined towards the social justice perspective, more often than not stress the African, even if their larger group does not, um, they themselves will ascribe to that, you know, that's what it is an African art. Thank you. I'm, I'm interested in what the, the photos that you have. <laughs> Um, it, it was uh, it looked like capoeiristas on stage, and that's oh, yeah. when you began talking about those who were not present in social justice work. I'm wondering if you could. Yeah. So that picture, I actually, I love that picture. It's a still from a video I took. Um, this group, I will say, is socially, they're inclined towards the social justice perspective. Um, but why that image stands out in my mind is they were giving a public demonstration uh, to a group of like second graders at a, I don't know, in a theater. It's very clearly a stage performance. Um, and they staged this little skit where, if we go back to the bright blue one, Oh, down. Down? Down, down. This there, one? yes, that one. Yes, yeah, so um, the girl that's like sticking her behind out, um, she is the, the love object in this little skit. And so she walks on stage, there's a capoeira game going on and these guys want to see her. They like stop playing capoeira and they just start doing backflips and everything they can do to like show off and impress her and win her heart. And it like, she, she starts walking off with one um, and then another guy comes and literally kicks her. Um, and she is so impressed by that. She's like, ooh, bye, man, let's go. Um, and I was so disturbed. I was sitting here in this audience. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't just stay here because I thought y'all were awesome. And what is going on? Um, the next scene opens here. Um, and the, the guys are playing the bamboo. The lovers are out on a stroll and she wants to play. So she asks for the bamboo and they laugh at her, right? Um, and then she like taps them on the shoulder again and they still laugh at her. And then she has this great moment. She pulls her hair back and ponytail and it's like, ah, oh. like she means business now. And she just grabs the thing and she starts playing beautifully, right? And the guys like step back in amazement and all of the women come out on stage and they take over and the guys go away. And they start singing the song Gunga and Mayo, um, which means the Gunga, like the most important of the bear mask is mine. Um, nobody's gonna take it from me. And it's just like this female power. Um, so yeah, there's like this, there's, there's a lot of tensions within the Capoeira community. Um, but that to me is like a very much a, a pro-woman 
statement that they were making. But thank you. Thank you very much. I think it ends our question and answer session. Thank you very much, Sean, again. Merci beaucoup.